Hi everyone, Azrael Knight here, and welcome to part five of Darkroom Nights 2021, a mini series where I use different enlargers, different chemicals, different developers, all for the sake of creating a limited edition box set of my favorite black and white photos of 2020. Now, while it might be seamless to you, the public, um, my patrons might notice, I actually took two days off. And the reason for that being is, well, there's actually a couple of reasons. One, I was completely and absolutely exhausted. Four days straight in the dark room was very taxing. And I wanted to make sure that I wasn't starting to get lazy with my photos and printing process. I wanted to make sure I was giving it my full attention. And I tend to create a delay between the time that I record and the time that I release to the public for instances like this where I just... I just need to sleep and boy oh boy did I sleep two nights in a row I slept almost 11 hours a night which is probably about five more hours than I normally get the second reason is I was actually expecting some chemicals to come in on Friday and they didn't I was really frustrated because I picked express shipping for the sake of getting it in time for this mini series and there's some pretty cool chemicals coming. And now it says Tuesday and today is Monday. So I'm hoping to be able to show you those chemicals either on day six or day seven, hopefully both, but at least one of those days, I wanna be able to mix up my chemical process. Nonetheless, I think I have a very interesting episode for you today. Behind me here is the very first enlarger I ever owned. Plus, I'm gonna show you the easiest way to mix up Dectol. Let's get started. Mixing up Dectol and other powders is usually fairly straightforward. You want to get your water up to the required temperature, in this case between 32 and 38 Celsius or 90 to 100 Fahrenheit. You want to be able to get 3 liters of that, then mix in the powder, then add another 800 milliliters. Usually pretty straightforward. Most other instructions will have something similar to this. Once your Dectol is mixed up, you'll have something called your stock solution. In order to create a working solution, the stuff that you're actually going to dip your paper into, you'll want to dilute it with more water. In this case, you're diluting one part stock solution with two parts water to create your working solution. Now here's what I use in order to prep my water and get everything ready. Now when I say it's the easiest, I mean it's the easiest after you've bought what you needed. I have a sous vide that I just bought from Walmart. I've got a four liter jug of distilled water. I have a digital thermometer telling me what the temperature of the water inside the jug is. And of course a tub. In addition to that, you're gonna want a face mask and eyewear. And the main reason for that is this is going to be a fine powder that you're pouring. It's going to release a fine powder into the air no matter how careful you are. And you want to protect your face and you want to protect your eyes. The goggles might be a little hard to come by, but if you don't have a mask by now, what are you doing, man? There's a couple more things you're going to need. I'll get to that in a second. I set the sous vide up to a temperature higher than what I need just so it gets up to the temperature in the distilled water jug quicker. Right now I'm at 91.6 Fahrenheit. Every so often I'm gonna wanna take that thermometer out and give it a shake, just so all the water's even. So I could put it in at this point, but I wanna get the water closer to 100 just to make sure. Now here's a couple other things that you're gonna need. You're going to want scissors in order to cut the bag of Dectol open and at least a four liter jug, but I actually recommend a five liter jug. The reason for that is to minimize splashing if you're stirring vigorously. One of my favorite ways to stir is to use a magnetic stirrer. Now this magnetic stirrer isn't exactly recommended for five liters, 
but I'm not putting the full five liters in there. I'm only putting 3.8 and I've used it for that amount before and it's worked out just fine. If you're not familiar with magnetic stirrers, it's basically a little pill that goes into the jug and spins around super fast and does the stirring for you. If you don't have this, a cooking spoon will do just fine. And I also tend to assist the magnetic stirrer anyway with something random just to help it speed along. Something like this. Okay, my water is now at about 99 Fahrenheit. I don't need the sous vide anymore. And if I pull the jug out, the water level will get low enough where it'll start warning beeping me because uh, you're not supposed to run this thing without water or enough water. So I'm going to pour my first three liters into the jug. I almost forgot the one other thing that you should have. And that is gloves. You should definitely have gloves while using this. Dectol is a skin irritant. So I'll stick my magnetic pill in there and turn it on. There we go. A little less annoying if it goes off to the side. I tend to pour a little in and help it on its way just until I hear the pill struggling. And then I'll leave that until it's all mixed in. You'll be able to tell when it's mixed in. Now, once you're confident, that it's all mixed in there properly, you can go ahead and put in the last 800 milliliters of water. Then I go ahead and I mix that up again, just for good measure. Again, once you're confident that everything is mixed up, you can go ahead and pour it into its final container. Now, if you don't have a proper container, just go ahead and pour it into an empty jug of distilled water. You might be asking, how am I going to get that magnet out of the bottom of my jug? And that's with another magnet. And there you have it, a super easy way to mix up Dectol. Next up, I want to tell you guys about the very first enlarger I ever owned, which contains two names I can't pronounce, the Miopta Opimus 2A. It's a Czechoslovakian enlarger, and that's probably why I can't pronounce the words, because I'm not Czechoslovakian. Before I started this mini-series, I tried to do research on as much of the enlargers as I could. Now, I didn't find information on all of them, but I did find the transcription of a review of this one all the way back in January 1968, which gives you an idea of just how old this thing is. It is at least 50 years old. The review in question comes from Modern Photography Magazine, published in January 1968, and I'm going to read you some of the highlights. It is an all-metal construction with a single post, that post being the train that the enlarger travels up and down in order to change the size of your final print. It prints between 35 millimeter to two and a quarter by two and a quarter, or as it's most commonly known, six by six. Now it says here that there's a 50 millimeter Bellar and a 75 millimeter Bellar. I've got the 75 millimeter Bellar, but I don't have the 50. I have the 55. Same thing, basically. Manual rack and pinion with focusing bellows. It is a double condenser optical system. Adjustable glass negative carrier with rangefinder focusing, filter drawer, uh, red safe light filter, horizontal or vertical enlarging, and the price is 109.95 US. That 
is expensive. I wonder how much that is by today's standards. 109.95 US in 1968 money is this amount in US money in 2021. Few are the photographers who can steal the space required for a large darkroom, and it doesn't matter if they live in an apartment or in a house of their own. The Miopta Optimus 2A may have well been designed for the tight little darkroom. It stands only 29 inches high to the top of its angled column, but you can make a full 11 by 14 print on the baseboard. And if you need something larger, you can simply swivel the head 90 degrees and project onto a wall. For apartment dwellers, it can be disassembled in minutes by unlocking two large knobs, one each at the baseboard and lamp housing assembly. The Miopta is a small but precision machine. The rack and pinion system for both the lamp house and the bellows focusing system works smoothly. More important for the color printer, there's hardly a light leak from its dark red glass encasing lamp housing. We spent several long printing sessions with the Miopta and can report that its heat dissipating system really works. The machine never gets too hot to touch comfortably. One of the really big features for the man in a hurry is its rangefinder focusing system, which is actually part of the adjustable negative carrier. Pull the carrier part way out and two lines are projected onto the easel. Line up the two lines by rotating the bellows control knob and the negative is properly focused. I didn't know that. We have always been exponents of various optical critical focusing devices, but we could discern no difference in the sharpness with prints made using a separate focuser or the range finder to determine sharpness. And the range finder was a whole lot faster to use. In general, the Miopta proved to be a sensibly designed, well-engineered machine. I, I actually found the article, but I didn't read it. I wanted to make sure that if I learned anything that you'd get my honest reaction. Apparently there's some kind of rangefinder device on it. I may or may not try and use that thing today. Um, yeah, fascinating. Now, before I can even use the thing though, I have to do two things. I have to blow all the dust right off of it and I have to align it. Uh, this thing hasn't been used in I want to say five years. I might have used it once when I tried to put the darkroom underneath my stairs in this place, but I think I still managed to cram the Bessler into there anyway. I can't even remember now, but I can tell you this thing wasn't in uh, regular working order for at least five years. Here's the filter tray, and then this twists off. There's no light bulb in there. I'll have to make sure I get the light bulb. There is a little tension ring in here. You just pinch that. And then that comes out. The ring comes out. And that piece comes out as well. I'm assuming this diffuses the heat. It feels like it's made out of Bakelite. All this is very dusty. Then you have screw on either side here and then this lifts right off this I believe twists and comes off yep with tension right there and then this twists off as well give it a gentle pat and then the lens itself comes right off and then there's the bottom lens I have full access to the bottom lens, so I don't need to take it off. But if I wanted to, there are these little tension bits in there. You can see from this end, they're just bent in metal things holding the lens in with tension. Here's the carrier. Now, the thing that I love about this carrier is that there are, there's glass to hold the negative flat, but then, there is also these sliders where you can create on all four sides to just a specific part and expand on that. You can, um, but that lets you use pretty much anything between a 35 millimeter and a six by six. There are some disadvantages to a glass carrier like extra dust, but overall it's a little, I think it's worth it. Unscrew this portion here and the lens holder comes out there. There are also these screws at the top here, 
Let me change my angle so you can see. I keep these screws with this little tension band here. There we go. And that takes this off as well as this. As you can see, this thing comes apart very easily. I'm sure there's a couple more things that I could take apart if I wanted to. But for our cleaning purposes today, this is more than enough. For today's cleaning, I'll be using gloves, microfiber cloths, a can of air, and for the glass, I've got screen cleaner. I feel like this is safe enough. If it's good enough for an LCD monitor, a hunk of glass, it's probably going to be just fine with. Yeah, so now that you've seen me take it apart, on comes the montage of cleaning it and putting it back together. Okie dokie, my enlarger is all dusted off, wiped down, and aligned. Today's paper is going to be Oriental Siegel G4, fiber-based paper. Uh, now I've got G2, G3, and G4. So the first thing that I gotta do is fog test this thing to make sure the paper's okay. If it is, then I am good to go. Okay, so I did my initial strip test with three second intervals in between each strip and I settled on seven and a half seconds for my first print. After I ran the first print through, I realized something, and that is, it's funny, but I no longer like this photo. For some reason, I liked it on the digital scan, but it does not translate onto a print. And that happens, that happens a lot to people. They, they see something that they think looks good on screen, and then once it's uh, printed off, they're like, yeah, this doesn't work for me. So I'm actually going to choose a different photo. Okay, it has been an extremely frustrating last couple of hours. Uh, after I realized I was unhappy with my choice, I had to go into my Lightroom catalog and pick one of the runners up. It's actually a fantastic photo that I took for my Canon EOS ELAN first impressions video. I shot it on top of a parkade during a really foggy day and it was moments before security actually came up to presumably kick me out but I sort of ran away. <laughs> I didn't run away. I, I walked away with intention. Anyway, um, it's a fantastic shot. I really like the fog and the, the streets and the cars and all the little details and everything. What I don't like is a tiny little hair it was incredibly persistent. I would print off a, a shot, I'd get to the washing phase, and there it was. And I'd go back and I'd dust and clean and wipe everything down, and then I would print off another one and the hair just moved over. So I'm like, over at the trays during the first washing phase with my phone flashlight, staring, looking for any possibility of a hair, and it happened like three times. And when it happens three times with a fiber-based photo, you lose like 20 minutes. So, you know, a tiny little hair cost me over an hour at the very least. Um, I've got a print now in the HypoClear, ready for the second wash in about five and a half minutes. And this time, this time I am almost certain after very carefully looking everything over, that there is no tiny little hair, and I'm gonna be able to finish the rest of my print run here. It, it takes a lot of time. Every time I take that negative out, I've got to put it back in, I've got to align it again with the easel, I've got to refocus it, and I've gotta make sure that the lens is closed down, all these tiny little steps. So 
I gotta say, not a big fan of glass carriers. I remember why I didn't like them, because there's an additional four surfaces that can collect dust. On the top of the first glass, on the bottom of the first glass, on the top of the second glass, on the bottom of the second glass. And yeah, so if the hair is still on the uh, final print, it is in an inconspicuous area and I I can only look at the photo for so long before I've got to move forward. If there is a hair on the final print, it's the only one, and hopefully you'll forgive me. But I'm pretty confident I obliterated it. Okay, folks, it's the next day, and I really wanted to just buckle down and get those photos put out. Now, uh, again, I've been using fiber-based prints, and I've been getting progressively better at drawing them. Let's have a look. This here is the stack of photos that made the cut. Uh, the total is nine, and I gotta say, uh, for the most part, they look pretty good. Um, there were a decent amount of rejects too. I actually found that the emulsion, or whatever you want to call it, was starting to peel off on a few of these. And others had that dreaded waviness um, on the one end as opposed to the other. The only thing that I can think of is that the print dryer isn't evenly heated all across. But one, two, three, four, five didn't make it, and nine did make it. That's pretty decent. I'm actually happy with that. Especially since the total number of prints that did make it uh, didn't lower my overall uh, box set number. It's still at nine. But yeah, as you can see, no little tiny hair to annoy me or my potential buyers. I'm actually really happy that I switched photos at the end. This one suits my, my style a lot more, I think. And it was nice to have a photo that wasn't from a specific project, like a Fortnite of film, or my Badlands project, or my Anglewood project. It was just a photo that I happened to take while I was out that day. But yeah, that's all for now. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, I have a PayPal donation link in the description. $1, $2, $5. Every little bit helps this channel out immensely. Or you can join me on Patreon. You get free prints, your name in the credits, and early access to my videos. You can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter, and until next time, stay classic.